Pardon, said the little boy, and ran away. I walked back toward Monsieur Barthélemy's shop a little way with my companion, because I had one more call to make. There used to be a Madame Rocagel, who kept a cleaning and pressing shop on the Avenue Kleber. I had taken my suits there to be pressed in 1918 and 1919, and I had always liked her. She was gracieuse, and she complimented me on my ungainly French, and I used to stay and try it out on her. She had been then a woman of perhaps fifty. Her daughter, a pretty girl of fourteen, had helped her in the shop, studying English in her spare time and practicing it on me once in a while when I called and found her alone. I had dropped in to see Madame Rocagel and Marie in 1925, and Madame had been there, but her daughter was away. Now once again I found Madame alone, very gray, seventy, as gracious as ever, still carrying on. We talked about the old days. She assured me my French was remarkable. Perhaps she meant incroyable. I asked about Marie. Had she married? Oh, mais non. Marie was out somewhere shopping or reading a book in a park. Madame asked me to have a glass of Malaga with her, but I was running out of phrases, so I left with my best bow. Marie, I calculated on my way back toward the Place de l'Etoile, must be all of thirty-three now. I wondered if she was still pretty. I wondered how good her English was after nineteen years. Thirty-three. It was difficult to think of her as anything except the eager, dark-eyed little girl of fourteen who used to try so hard, so blushingly, and with such a charming accent to say the the way I said it. Thirty-three. I found myself getting leg-weary, and I hailed a cab before I got to the arch. Paris, I thought as I climbed into the cab, may never change, as the saying goes, but people do. I'm not as young as I once was myself. La Grande Ville de Plaisir There is an old saying that if Paris had a street like Canabière, it would be a little Marseille, to which I shall add that if Marseille had a promenade des Anglais, it would be a little Nice. Marseille is famous for the dark dangers of its back streets and for mysterious doings along its waterfront. Just the other day, boxes containing 6,000 gold watches in transit from Geneva to Buenos Aires were eased of their treasure and magically filled with chunks of cement on a quay in Marseille. You may have read about that. The police news of Marseille has a habit of getting on the international press wires. The activities of lawbreakers in Nice, on the other hand, may often be read about only in the local papers, of which my favorite is the enormously interesting L'Eclaireur de Nice et du Sud-Est. The voleurs of Nice take as a rule one watch at a time, or one wallet, but they frequently manage it in a picturesque fashion. If you should see a fat and jovial priest drop a well-filled billfold behind him on the promenade, return it to him, bow politely, wink, and proceed on your way. Tarry not to make an acquaintance that will show rapid signs of ripening into a pleasant and perhaps profitable companionship. The dropped wallet is the opening move in an ancient swindle that works like a charm in this friendly climate. When I was in Nice twelve years ago, the wolves in priests' clothing, sometimes it was in the clothing of retired philanthropists or bankers, reaped, as the saying goes, a rich harvest. I remember a professor of economics in a Pennsylvania college who waited for three hours in a cafe for his old pal the priest to show up. This particular variant of the venerable racket had begun with a most interesting talk about faith in one's fellow man, and had ended by the professor agreeing to prove his own faith in his fellow man by allowing the priest to walk around the block with his, the professor's, wallet. Usually the old game is worked with considerably more subtlety. Often several enjoyable weeks drift by before the Holy Father or the philanthropist or the banker feels the fruit is ripe enough for the plucking. Always in the end a gentleman of great faith is left sitting in a cafe or a hotel room, looking anxiously at his wristwatch, unless, of course, he has lent that to his good friend, too. In the winter of 1925, the Riviera edition of the Chicago Tribune, for which I was a reporter, ran every day on its front page a warning about the swindlers. It didn't seem to do much good. The general run of waywardness in Nice may be on a lesser scale than that of Marseille, but it is infinitely more fascinating. Inconnus are found mysteriously injured, Malheureux get into all kinds of curious difficulties, and Delicat are found wandering around with nothing on. 
If you have to keep your ear to the ground and your eye to the éclaireur to learn about them, it is partly because Nice is a carnival city whose daily news is drowned in a trumpeting of ballyhoo and a showering of confetti. The syndicates d'initiative and the Rotary Club, surely the strongest outside the United States, and the other organizations that go in for rosy pictures of this grand ville des plaisirs, dwell so loudly on the climate and the carnival that the casual visitor would not imagine anything out of the way ever happened here. And yet, like another poictesme, it is a place in which almost anything is more than likely to happen. The night I arrived in the city, recently, a malheureux ran across the Place Massena, bleeding copiously from a cut throat and gurgling, Je vais mourir. He didn't die, however. The next night, a man scurried past me, hotly pursued by a woman who kept screaming, Police! Nobody paid any attention. It is always with a sense of high expectation that I set out into the city. If the day's excitement doesn't break actually about my head, I can always read about it in the Eclaireur. At 2.30 yesterday afternoon, I see by the paper before me, in the Rue Bala, an Algerian named Tayeb Mihoubi was stabbed by a Moroccan named Mohammed ben Mohammed. One Madame Grocorini, having irked a gentleman named Valerio Franchi, was slashed by the gentleman's knife, and when a Monsieur Ricci rashly intervened, he was slashed too. Knives rise and fall on this lovely littoral as easily and for as little provocation as a woman's tears. There are thousands of Italians and Corsicans in Nice, and a great gathering of Algerians, Moroccans, and somber dark men from a dozen other countries. The city has been a place of sojourn and foray ever since it was founded by the Phoenicians twenty centuries ago. It has been overrun by Ligurians, Celts, Romans, Saracens, Englishmen, and Americans. It has a tradition of restlessness. One of the most remarkable manifestations of the restlessness of Nice and the surrounding country is the bagarre. Bagarre means violent disorder, uproar, crush, squabble, scuffle, fray. Today's éclaireur tells of the final disposition in the courts of a famous bagarre, more exactly known as La Fusillade de la Place Arsène, which took place as long ago as August 1936. The wheels of justice turned slowly in the South. As is usually the case with bagarres, nobody knows exactly how or why this one started, but it had something to do with politics. In the end, scores of men were involved, and more than 200 shots were fired. Nobody was killed or even seriously injured, which the éclaireur admits it is at a loss to understand, and so am I. Most of the shooting took place at close quarters. There must have been a kind of carnival touch about so much spectacular and aimless gunfire. Anyway, the case has been finally disposed of. Eight men were fined 25 francs each, or less than a dollar, for illegal possession of firearms. That was all. The éclaireur intimates that it was not considered discreet to prosecute the defendants on any more serious or relevant charges. Such a procedure, one gathers, could easily start a bagarre all over again, perhaps right there in the courtroom. Of recent bagarres, the one that has interested me most took place in a village a few miles from Nice, but since it was of the very scheme and rhythm of many a similar happening within the city limits, I must report it. It will give you as clear an idea as may be had of what a bagarre is like. The éclaireur launches into the puzzling story in this manner. In spite of promises given, in spite of appeals for calm, the closing of the Institute of Actinology was not accomplished without incident. I do not know what an Institute of Actinology is or why it should be difficult to close one without incident. Probably anywhere else in the world it would be child's play to close an Institute of Actinology. But not in Nice or vicinity. It was the Messrs. Mandouche, Guénon, and Billet, and a Madame Varane who tried to close this one. Monsieur Guénon was immediately set upon by a young man named Roba, who was accompanied by the Messrs. Lanteri, Bernardi, and Grindou. Monsieur Roba beat Monsieur Guénon savagely about the head, either with a rock or a poing américain, brass knuckles. A. M. Monty drifted into the scuffle from somewhere, rescued Monsieur Guénon, and took him to a doctor who bandaged his wounds. Afterward, Monsieur Guénon went to a café run by a Monsieur Longuier, and was having a glass of something to steady his nerves when one Vincent Martino entered, saw the injured man's bandages, and asked him what had happened. 
Before he could get a reply, Monsieur Martino was punched in the head by Monsieur Baraco. From here on, the story loses its sharp clarity. Monsieur Martino whipped out a gun, but hastily hid it in a cardboard box when a policeman entered. Monsieur Ganon and Monsieur Baraco drop quietly out of the tortured narrative at this point, but Monsieur Martino was led off to the police station. That didn't cause things to quiet down. A crowd of 300 people gathered about the cafe, says the éclaireur, shouting and gesticulating. Women mingled in the crowd, also shouting and gesticulating. Presently, some cops shouldered their way through the mob, not to restore order, it turns out, but to hunt for Monsieur Martino's gun, which the first agent had neglected to seize. They found the gun and went away. The crowd stayed and grew increasingly menacing as the night wore on, so that Monsieur Logier finally had to close the café. We learned that the police investigations went on late into the night, but just what angles of the involved case they were investigating is not made clear. I have an idea, though. They were concentrating on Monsieur Martino's gun. The éclaireur ends the story with this musical sentence. Dans la rue, le calme est long à revenir. That, then, is a typical bagarre, violent, cloudy, complicated. It is no use trying to fit the incidents together into a logical pattern. The éclaireur and the police gave that up long ago, and so did I. There is an embarrassing richness of clippings before me, cut from the éclaireurs of only one week. Several standing headlines recur frequently, one of them the simple phrase, Le pochard. A pochard is a drunk. The headline has something of the slangy, sardonic force of Among the Soust, or With the Cockeyed. The stories deal briefly with the activities of gentlemen who, while in their cups, have caused a slight scandal here, a mild outrage there. Another headline, Le Conducteur Imprudent et Maladroit, tops almost every day a considerable list of automobile accidents. I note that just yesterday a big hispano suiza sports roadster, driven by a baron, knocked down a lamp post on the Promenade des Anglais, and that shortly afterward another imprudent knocked down a palm tree. The promenade is more dangerous than the Place de la Concorde. I remember that when I was here before, the éclaireur ran a picture of a promenade traffic cop who was in the hospital for no less than the seventh time as the result of having been knocked down by a motorist on that broad thoroughfare. My clippings deal with a dozen other varied and spectacular episodes, but I shall go into detail only about the curious case of Monsieur Antoine Semeria, aged 47, a mechanicien dentiste, because it is typical of a special class of bizarre goings-on in this paradise on the Bay of Angels. Monsieur Samaria was dragged up before Monsieur Giocanti, commissaire of police, because he had refused to pay his fare on an autobus. He explained to the commissaire that it was his invariable custom not to pay for riding on autobuses. Ride on them he would, pay he would not, and that was that, the commissaire would see. Monsieur Giocanti listened patiently for a while, and then directed that Monsieur Samaria be put away in a hospital for observation. Monsieur Samaria was placed in the hospital, escaped immediately, boarded the first bus that came along, once more refused to pay, and was hauled up before the commissaire again, before you could say Giocanti. I have touched on only one or two special phases of the rich life of this great colorful city of almost 250,000 inhabitants, not counting the visitors, who nearly double the permanent population, that sprawls between the mountains and the sea. Up on the hill, back of the town, is the old Roman quarter called Simiez, where Queen Victoria stayed, a region almost as sedate and quiet as it was in her time, but considerably more crowded. From the heights above the city, you can look down on a panorama as diverse as life itself. The streets of the shopkeepers and the bourgeoisie in the more modern part of town the narrow rues of the Vieville down by the sea where the Italians live, the Faubourg of the Port of Nice, which visitors rarely get to, and the region around the Place Massena, Centre de l'Animation, Cour de la Vie, which visitors seldom get away from. The main thoroughfare of the tourists' quarter is, of course, the Promenade des Anglais. It was in hotels along this boulevard that Isadora Duncan, Rudolph Valentino, Harry Sinclair lived when I was here before. 
In those four, you have a colored postcard picture of this centre de vie joyeuse in the gay days before the Depression. It was an exciting winter, the winter of 1925. Nowadays, I more or less wander around an outsider on a visit, but that season I was in the midst of the excitement. I think it was the Hotel Roule Anglais that I called up the night 12 years ago when a wire came to us on the Tribune saying that Serge Yesenin, Isadora Duncan's former husband, had killed himself in Moscow. I was directed to get the great lady on the phone and find out what she had to say. It sometimes seemed to me that this nasty business of interviewing bereaved women was what editors figured me to be cut out for in my days as a newspaper man. The hotel reported that Miss Duncan was out and was not expected back before one o'clock in the morning. At a little after one, ours was a morning newspaper, I got her on the phone. It came out that she had not yet heard about the death of the man with whom she had once led such a tumultuous life. I am sure I must have managed it all very badly. I was scared. I remember that she said nothing but no, 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 which she repeated a dozen times, and that finally she let the receiver fall. I called back the hotel and, speaking English to a puzzled French night clerk, shouted at him to do something about Miss Duncan. I have no idea what he did. I never saw Isadora Duncan. The next day, however, she granted interviews to other reporters and, according to the Eclaireur, told them she felt sure that the poem which Yesenin is reported to have written in his own blood before he died was a poem to her. It was, I believe, on the promenade des Anglais of this violent city that Isadora Duncan met her tragic and implausible end when a scarf she was wearing trailed out of the car she was riding in, caught in a wheel, and choked her to death. I remember my phone call to Isadora Duncan all too clearly. I remember, too, how indestructibly healthy Valentino, who had only a few months to live, looked, and how Harry Sinclair, consenting warily to an interview, never once met my gaze, but stared at me out of the corner of his right eye. Nobody, however, so surely typified for me the faintly sinister fascination of this ancient city of the Phocians, as did a tall young Hindu who showed up silently and ominously in the little office of the Tribune one night. We had, a week before, advertised for a proofreader who knew English, and more than fifty persons had answered the ad, among them the young Hindu. They were an amazing group. A Belgian woman of 75, a former captain in the British Army, a Russian prince, a Scotch teacher, a French painter, all sorts and conditions of drifters and dreamers, the flotsam of 50 nations that you can raise with one signal or another from Simiers up on the hill to the steep streets of the old town by the sea. The editor had finally hired the former British Army man, but our Hindu, who appeared so softly out of the night, swore vehemently that it was he who had been hired. His dark stare was menacing. His perfect English had a dangerous edge. He was as straight-backed as a knife. I have come for the job I was hired for, he said. I am ready to start work. The editor, looking a little gray, said he had hired another man. Oh, no, you haven't, said the Hindu quietly, and then shouted, You hired me! There was an unbearably long silence while he glared at each of us in turn. Then suddenly, turning on the editor again, he cried, I know who you are and all about you. You are lame leg Charlie, the dope fiend. Remember this, you haven't seen the last of me. And the door somehow opened behind him, and he was gone. The editor's name was not Charlie, he was not lame, and he didn't take dope. Our visitor's dark threat and his darker revelations, which were never cleared up, left us all a little shaken. It turned out that we had seen the last of our Hindu, but there never was a night that I didn't expect him to show up again to wreak whatever peculiar vengeance it is that frustrated Hindu proofreaders go in for. I put this story in because Nice is like that. Nice is like this, too. One day in 1926, the Mistral, that violent and unpredictable wind from the Alps, came to town like a cavalcade of desperadoes, drunk and firing from both hips. It knocked over chimneys, ripped off signs, tore shutters loose from windows. I was walking with a lady in the Avenue Felix Fora when the terror descended. The lady walked, I am happy to say, very fast, so fast that we were able to step clear of fifty tons of bricks that suddenly roared and thundered to the pavement behind us. A high parapet surmounting a row of six one-story shops 
and forming a false second-story front, had been toppled into the street by the wind, hurricaning behind it. I can still see with too great clarity the hand of a man who was killed in the wreckage, sticking up out of his tomb of bricks. A few moments before, I had been abreast of him. The lady, as I have said, was a fast walker. All this, then, past and present, is Nice, the capital of gaiety, the mother city of this bright shore of winter playgrounds. If I have made her seem perhaps a trifle too violent, I must make some amends. Nice has her quiet moments, her tranquil quartiers. She has even her proud memories of a holy visitation. It is nice to know, as you walk past the trim façade of the Hôtel Beau Rivage on the Quai des Etats-Unis, that on a November day fifty years ago, a certain obscure Frenchman named Martin decided to stay there one night with his two daughters, Céline and Thérèse. It is nice to know that from one of the wide windows, Thérèse Martin looked out on the palm trees and the deep blue of the Bay of the Angels. It is an enchanting view. Who knows what high resolve it may not have inspired in the young girl, who was to become perhaps the most beloved of all the saints in the calendar to the people of her country, Sainte Thérèse dans l'Enfant Jésus, France's little flower. Or you can walk into the peaceful old graveyard of the English Church of the Holy Trinity and ponder on the modest tombstone of a reverend English gentleman, Henry Francis Light of Lower Brixham in Devon, whose prayer that he might leave behind some blessing for his fellows, some fair trust to guide, to cheer, to elevate mankind, was answered in, of all places, Nice, where just before he died in November 1847, he was moved to write the surely immortal hymn that begins, Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. Eventide in November falls very fast indeed in Nice. The darkness caught me one afternoon two months ago in the little graveyard, but not before I had seen the gleam of a small white card tacked to the church door. I went over to see if some fair trust might not be lettered on it. The living actuality of Nice abruptly overtook me there in the gloaming, dispelling my mood of reverie. The card sadly announced that because of numerous thefts, the place of worship had to be kept locked. Visitors were requested to ask the sexton for the key. Journey to the Pyrenees The day after the Czechs shot the two Germans in the spring of 1938, we were in a service flat off Piccadilly, having driven up from Dover two days before through alternating patches of rain and hawthorn blossom, sunshine and hail. McCulloch brought up the morning papers with the toast and coffee, and we read about the crisis. McCulloch looked worried. This, it came out, was only because he managed a building with eleven flats, all occupied, and illness among his servants had kept him understaffed. We talked about the drive up from Dover and about last year's weather, it hadn't rained once during the two weeks of Wimbledon. McCulloch said that if we should want tea later in the afternoon, just to give him a ring. After breakfast, we walked through Hyde Park, which was crowded because it was a warm, sunny day. People were lying on the grass, sitting on chairs, playing with their dogs. The place was full of Scotties and Spaniels and wire-haireds, chasing balls, barking at the swans. We idled along and caught the drift of conversations about the shocking defeat of England by Switzerland in a soccer game at Zurich, about the dark outlook for the English Davis Cup team against the Yugoslavs at Zagreb. Nobody was talking about Czechoslovakia. It reminded me of Juan Le Pen on the day after the Hitler coup in Vienna. The wisteria and the white iris had come into bloom. The weather was fine, and people were out in their brightest clothes, talking about this and that, shouting at their children, playing with their dogs. It reminded me of the day we had driven into Luchon, too, on the edge of the Spanish War. This story is mainly about driving to Luchon and the quiet we ran into there. The going in Gaul has vastly improved since the year 218 B.C., when Hannibal took a month to push his 37 elephants from the Valley of the Rhone to the pass of the little St. Bernard on his celebrated journey from Cartagena to the outskirts of Rome. Nowadays, on the fine French roads, you could get from Juan Le Pen to Luchon between sunrise and sunset if you had to, and you wouldn't have to go as fast as Prince Bernard of Holland, 
who recently did 90 miles an hour between Cannes and Avignon for the hell of it, burning out the bearings of his special racing car so that new ones had to be sent to him by plane from Rome. We took four days getting to Luchon, which is fast enough through this storied country. There hadn't been any rain to speak of on Cap d'Antibes for months, and people had been going to the little chapel of La Garoupe to pray for it. They weren't worried about war, they were worried about drought. The morning we started out, the sky was cloudy, but there was a south wind which Maria, cook and prophet, said would prevail and keep off the rain, prayers or no prayers. The gods crossed her up when we got into the Estorel. The wind shifted into the east, and the Roman ruins in Frejus were soaked when we passed through. The rain freshened up the white and purple lilacs and the trolley tracks of Toulon, making them fine for skidding. The motorists of Provence perpetuate the violent old traditions of this beau pays. One of them in Toulon tried to pass a moving trolley car on a wet, narrow street, banged into a curb, banged into the car, got tagged in the spare tire as he forged ahead onto the tracks, but managed to keep on going in a series of swooping skids. The driver and the watman, as the French so wonderfully call motormen, kept shouting vilifications at each other throughout the whole scene. There is no fear can silence the indignant volubility of a French motorist, or even make him keep both hands on the wheel. The thing to do is stop when you sense these things happening, even a block away. Ours is another madness set to a different rhythm, and no American can hope to comprehend the highly specialized patterns woven so suddenly and so magically on the shuttle of French roads. One should lie low when the French begin to bang into each other and wait until the desperate design is disentangled and the highway is quiet again. The roads of France are notable for their straightness and their sound surfacing. Outside of towns, there are a few blind crossings. You almost never see a pack of cars, nose to tail, chasing each other over the highways. Ten miles out of Paris, in any direction, you virtually have the road to yourself. But the French drive always at an angry rate of speed. They blow their horns wildly for crossings, but never slow down, and their favorite sport is passing a car that's passing a car on a three-lane road. They recognize no courtesies of the road and are confused if you extend any. Thus it is that they can hold their own with any nation in number and quality of crack-ups. Winding up back of Toulon, we got into moist spears of snow that turned to large, lazy flakes on the mountain top. On the other side, in true Provence, we came down onto dry roads under a summer sun. Here you begin to see, at the branching of highways, the exciting names of Avignon and Tarascon and Beaucaire. This is the land of the troubadours and the mistral, of Cezanne and bullfights, of nightingales and war. For all its blood and scars and glory, it is an innocent-looking land to drive through, flat and indolent, lonely and a touch scrubby. There are red poppies along the road and cypresses, but mainly your eye is caught by the plane trees, whose tops the French cut off in the first months of the year whenever they get around to it. Some of them look like the gnarled hands of old women. Some are as stark and nude as telegraph poles. On others, topped back earlier, irrepressible new branches have begun to shoot straight upward from the ravaged trunks like thousands of long green candles. It is a mystic tree in a strange country. It was raining again when we went through Aix-en-Provence, but in Arles, only forty miles away, which you reach over roads that are as quiet as roads on the moon, there hadn't been any rain for six months. The air was clear and keen, like October air, and everything had a high crystal sharpness and looked brand new. It was the same in Nîmes, where, under glass in the Maison Carrée, a handful of Americans have accomplished a curious kind of immortality. Showcases here contain a collection of Roman coins and an assortment of modern coins of various nations. There is a 1909 Lincoln penny, the gift one is assured of Mr. Herbert Claiborne Pill, Jr. There is also a tiny gold California quarter presented on the 20th of October, 1903, by Mrs. Frederick F. Thompson, and a three-dollar gold piece of 1854 added to the collection by Daisy M. Orlman, M.D., in memory of her visit to Nîmes on the 17th of March, 1904. In this region, in any season, you see the hurrying Hudsons and Lincolns of American tourists 
intent on taking in all in one day, Arles, Nîmes, Egmort, Tarascon, the Saint-Marie's, the Pont du Garde, the dead town of Les Beaux, the bridge in Avignon, and the old church in Saint-Gilles. Americans have a strange inability to spot each other in a foreign land. I was frequently complimented on my English by ladies and gentlemen from Oregon, New Jersey, Virginia, and even Ohio. You speak English very well, they invariably told me. Is because, I liked to reply, lapsing into my natural accent, I am leaving for 43 years in New York and Ohio. Think of that, they always said. I didn't get to talk to the Clevelanders, whose bright new car I saw in the ancient city under the Black Mountain, but I imagine they would have been astonished at my accent. Their license plates bore the announcement of the 150th anniversary of the opening of the Northwest Territory. The proud boast looked a little pale inside the walls of Carcassonne, and somehow reminded you of Shirley Temple cutting in on May Robeson with an anecdote about the old days. To get to Carcassonne, for I am ahead of myself, tourists usually go through Montpellier without stopping, but this can be a great mistake. There was a tremendous street carnival going on when we reached there, the largest I have seen in France, with at least 40 merry-go-rounds and similar dangerous contraptions, and two or three unforgettable sideshows. On the painted canvas walls of one of these, the sirens of the sea were advertised. First time in France, only 50 centimes to get in. Inside, in a tank six feet by four and perhaps five feet deep, an enormous young woman with gold teeth splashed around in the water, wearing a faded blue bathing suit and a white rubber cap, and wrestling with a snake perhaps four feet long, which was either dead or, worn out by the unequal struggle, had fainted. In an adjoining tent, labeled Spectacle de New York, one was privileged for 50 centimes to gaze upon the various methods by which gangsters are punished in the jails of that cruel city, the electric chair, the iron maiden, and the third degree, which last proved to be an iron-spiked battle axe. But what Montpellier will always bring to my mind first, I suppose, is an item I found in a copy of the London Times, which I managed to buy there. While the band was playing at the changing of the guard in the grand quadrangle of Windsor Castle yesterday, the remarkable news story announced, a pigeon settled on the bearskin of one of the guardsmen. The guardsman managed to shake it off, but it instantly flew onto the pack of another of the guard and refused to move until the company sergeant major advanced upon it. It then flew away. An article in an adjoining column announced with equal composure that the army of General Franco had reached the sea. From Carcassonne, a road runs northwest through the Cassoulet country to Toulouse. But for Luchon, you take the southwest route through the Pâté de Foie Gras country. Just outside the hamlet of Fanjou, you see the Pyrenees for the first time, like clouds in the sky, white and still and far away. You couldn't reach them before lunch, and the place to stop for that was the Hotellerie Babacan in Foix. The waiters were dressed in bright costumes of the region, and one of them told us that he had fought side by side with the Americans for four months during the First World War. He also told us that the sporting way to get to the next town, saint Giron, was by way of a narrow mountain road, C-17, a route both belle and sauvage. We went along it till we came to two workmen who told us we couldn't get through without chains on account of the snow, so we turned around, a feet on C-17, and went back to the national road that parallels the Pyrenees a little farther north. This road brought us to Montrejou, where we turned sharply south for Luchon and the Spanish border and rode toward one of the finest peaks of the range. Hemingway has written that in the Spanish shadow of the Pyrenees, which Republican militiamen and civilians began to crawl out of and march by way of the Val d'Aran, military positions could be held by determined graduates of any good girl's finishing school. It is interesting to note that in the first Catalonian campaign that threatened the stability of the world, 2,156 years ago, the native tribes of the region held off the advance of the Carthaginian army for several months, destroyed a fourth of it, but finally let Hannibal fight through to the mountains. The tribesmen of 218 B.C. had been promised help from Rome. 
One of the fondest speculations of military historians is whether Hannibal could have battled his way from the Ebro to the Pyrenees against Roman legions. When help never came, the Catalonians of 2,000 years ago probably felt as discouraged as the defenders of 1938 in the face of natural allies who seemed resigned to the triumph of Franco. I had expected to have to wind and climb through Luchon, but the road is straight and flat through the valley of a little stream called the Peak. All my expectations of Luchon turned out to be wrong. I had looked for crowds and turmoil, but there was no rumor of either. The French papers had been full of the flight over the mountains of anywhere from four to 8,000 people. Special writers had been sending out from Luchon the conflicting, patchy, and excited stories that French journalists do on such occasions. It is 25 miles from Montrejou into Luchon, a few sleepy white oxen were to be seen on the road and girls on bicycles and French soldiers wandering around in aimless groups of three or four. There was no sign of a refugee and no more feel of tension than you'd find in an apple orchard. The trees wore their new green, the peak burbled merrily along, and the mountains were as cold and untroubled as stars. A clock was striking seven when we drove into Luchon, but it was still bright daylight. The town was quiet and almost empty, a resort out of season. There were only a few people on the long, drowsy main street, a woman carrying a loaf of bread, a man trying to ride a bicycle and lead an unhappy calf at the same time, two army officers chatting and laughing. All the many hotels on this street except one were closed, and in the lobby of that one a single lonely figure moved slowly about. In a barber shop, the barbers lay relaxed in their chairs, one with a newspaper over his face listening to a loud radio. In the doorway of a deserted tabac, a girl watched the man and the calf with an unamused stare. A couturier's shop named Mary Jane and a bar called La Refuge slept behind their iron shutters. We drove around a big vacant square till we came to the hotel we had picked out in the Michelin Guide, it had been marked open all year. Luchon had two seasons, winter and summer. In between times, there was nothing going on. It was like an abandoned ballroom. There was no sign of life about the big hotel, which consisted of two five-story buildings joined together. I got out and tried one of the doors, but couldn't open it. A little boy of about eight appeared briefly in another door and gave us a surprised look. We went through that door into a vast, cold, and gloomy lobby. It was obvious that there were no guests in the place and hadn't been for a long time. The day was fading, and the lobby seemed to get larger and darker and colder as we stood there. Parts of the gloom moved, and they turned out to be an old woman and a younger woman. We found out that they ran the place. A porter silently detached himself from the darkness and brought in our bags. A chambermaid, whose white cap moved like a cloud in the night, led us up an enormous staircase to a big room that had been shuttered for months. She opened the shutters and went away, and came back with some firewood and a vase of lilacs. The room got fairly warm after a while. The man who had brought in our bags served dinner in our room at 8.30, having changed into freshly pressed waiter's clothes. I had peeked into the big dining room, and it was as cold as a skating rink. The waiter said his name was Francois, and that he was a Spaniard. Francois brought a map of Spain with the coffee and explained about the refugees. He said everything was so quiet because the border had been closed two days before. We had just missed the excitement. The French had handled the refugees with speed and competence. There weren't any more of them to be seen. Most of them had been put on trains to be sent back to Spain. The others were being taken care of in Toulouse, he thought, or somewhere. He had talked to some of the refugees as they came through. They were war-weary and discouraged. They said they had wandered around for weeks without seeing any officers. They had had enough. François's bias was anti-leftist. He said that he did not belong to any party. He was not for either side. But what Spain needed was a strong hand. With Franco's victory, there would come a strong hand. Mussolini and Hitler would have no say at all. Another hostile border for France? Nothing to worry about. Everything would be all right. There would be no fascism, just a strong hand that would make everything fine. 
Francois talked like a lot of people you used to hear chattering at tea parties in Europe. Only a miracle could win for the leftists, and there would be no miracle, said Francois. The next morning was bright and clear, and we drove on toward the border until the road began to narrow and crawl up the mountain, and we couldn't go any farther. We drove back through Luchon, passing one or two ox carts groaning along at a mile an hour under heavy loads of tree trunks. It was high noon in Luchon, but the town was still asleep. We stopped for lunch in Taub, where our waiter spoke English with a fine American accent. He wasn't interested in what we had seen in Luchon or what had been going on there. What he wanted to know was whether the Brevort Hotel still existed in New York. He said his father had been chef there twenty years before. We told him the Brevort was fine. From Tab, it was an easy drive to Lourdes, the town of miracles. And around there, we began to pick up tourists' cars again. It is interesting to find that Michelin, like Francois, does not believe in miracles, or anyway doesn't say anything about them. At the end of the information given about a town in the guidebook, you often find a mention of its specialty. For Lourdes, it says, Specialité Chocolat. After Cato, what? It may be true that the trains run on schedule in Italy now, but the guards at grade crossings are not taking any chances. They run their gates down anywhere from 15 to 40 minutes before a train comes along. I have often smoked half a pack of cigarettes waiting for a train at a crossing. Ox carts and mule carts pile up despondently. But you do not see many cars. Gasoline costs nearly 70 cents a gallon in Italy, and few Italians can afford to drive cars. This is fortunate, for Italians drive as if Hannibal were after them in a Duesenberg, and on crowded roads would soon kill each other off. The people of the European countries I have been in all drive wildly, but whereas the speed of the French grows out of a vivid impatience, and that of the English out of a studied recklessness, the fury of the Italians seems to be born of an angry hysteria. Descending from a vehicle, an Italian sheds his frenzy like a cloak, puts on a thin but comfortable apathy, and stands about in the street. The men of Italian towns and villages do not seem to do anything except stand in the street. Many of them stand quite still, others move around slightly. It is possible to drive through towns in Normandy and Brittany without seeing anybody, but the streets of Italian towns are almost impassable because of the men standing in them. In Grosseto one evening, I decided to stand around with the men of the town to see if I could find out what there is in it. I moved around with those who were moving around and then stood for a while with those who were just standing. It seemed very dull, but perhaps I didn't keep at it long enough. This singular Italian habit is not a strange phenomenon of the present political regimentation, for it originated more than 2,000 years ago. I quote from Theodore Mommsen's History of Rome. The habit of lounging was visibly on the increase. Cato the Elder proposed to have the marketplace paved with pointed stones in order to put a stop to the habit of idling. The Romans laughed at the jest and went on to enjoy the pleasure of loitering and gazing around them. After more than twenty centuries, the Italians still love to loiter and gaze around them. I feel the same way about it that Cato did. Cato the Elder is my favorite character in Italian history, and I am glad that we have come to him so soon. He was fond of a little incantation which he believed would ward off sprains, and he repeated it over and over whenever he felt a sprain coming on. Mommsen gives the formula for this potent in a footnote to his history, and I am pleased to pass it on to you. Whenever then you feel in danger of twisting a wrist or pulling a tendon, you just keep saying, Hawat, 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 ista, pista, sista, damia, boda, nostra. This is much simpler than another ancient Roman formula for the prevention of gout, which I feel sure old Cato would never have had the patience to go through with. In practicing this gout formula, says Mommsen, you had to think of some other person while fasting, and then repeat the incantation twenty-seven times, touching the earth each time, and spitting. Cato, I like to believe, would have regarded that one as a lot of newfangled tomfoolery, as idle as standing in the street. Cato regarded a great many things as tomfoolery, among them priests and women. His inquiry as to how a priest could meet another priest without laughing is still famous, and has been attributed to everybody from Roger Bacon to H. L. Mencken. 
he declared that all women are plaguy and proud, and that if a man were quit of them, he would lead a less godless life. He considered it a lot of damned nonsense and a major mistake on the part of the gods that women were so constituted as to play a necessary part in the perpetuation of the race. Gave them notions, made them think they were somebody. He wrote thousands of words denouncing women, practically all of them sound, but he had, unfortunately, no more effect on changing the morals of his day than D. H. Lawrence had on changing the morals of his. Indeed, Cato lived to see women emancipated to a position of troublesome independence. They possessed property. They raised their voices in the home. A few of them poisoned their husbands. Statues were erected to some of them here and there in Italy. Things reached, in short, that pretty pass where they have ever since remained. Cato's own family life was conducted with disciplined authority, but in spite of everything, with no little tenderness. None of the women of his household ever pushed him completely out of the supervision of any part of its activities. No child of his could be bathed and swaddled unless he was present or had given notice to the effect that he wouldn't be present. I have no doubt the old general could have changed an infant as well as anybody. I am sure he regarded women's pretensions to peculiar and mystic abilities in this connection as a lot of hokery-pokery. The line in all his writings which endears him to me most is that in which he set down with stern dignity the fact that none of his daughters ever caught him manifesting demonstrative affection toward his wife, except once during a thunderstorm when she was frightened. The old gentleman liked his food and his wine, and in his book on husbandry gives the recipe for his own pick-me-up for hangovers. He was wise enough to know that no chant is going to do you any good the morning after a bout with the wine cups. Howat, howat, howat is just so much Bodenostra at a time like that, and he was probably the first to find it out. The fact that he believed up to the day of his death that you could ward off sprains by making a noise like an owl simply proves how human he was. I am convinced that if Cato were alive, he would improve the system of transporting a motor car by water from Naples to Genoa, as it exists under the dread air of the Caesars. Nobody in Naples will tell you to begin with where the ship is. You have to hunt for it. This is to develop your sense of initiative and ingenuity. People who are told where ships are get soft. When you find the ship, they don't want to let you on. A man discovers that you have no Italian visa. You explain that an American doesn't have to have an Italian visa. He points out that nevertheless you haven't got one. When you are finally allowed on board, you are put in the wrong stateroom and are advised of this after you have unpacked your bags and lain down. This is to teach you to be ready for anything at any time. The purser then appears and takes your automobile papers away from you with an explanation similar to the undecipherable primitive Yapidian inscriptions that were found on the Calabrian Peninsula. The last that you saw of the automobile itself, it was drifting despondently out to sea on a large raft. If this does not teach you to have faith in the mysterious workings of a system you do not understand, nothing ever will. In Genoa in the morning, you wait for two hours for your car to be put on the dock, although it was the only one on the ship. All the gasoline has been taken out of it and none is put back in. The purser has disappeared from your life forever with your papers. You find yourself in the midst of several hundred men standing or moving slowly around. It now becomes necessary to take all your bags and your tennis rackets out of the car and carry them into the customs house. You explain that your bags have already passed the customs at Ventimiglia and that you haven't been out of Italy since. The customs man gives the old sprain incantation and sticks a tiny stamp on each bag. A soldier in a gray cloak makes two small pencil marks on each stamp. After you have found your papers and got some benzina, it would take hours to tell how this is done, you pile all the bags in the car and drive 90 feet to a man who looks like the man who put the stamps on. He is not, however. He is the man who takes the stamps off. You haul all the bags out of the car, and he removes the stamps one at a time. You pile the bags back in again, and you are ready to go. Thus has the genius of Mussolini instilled energy and efficiency into maritime transportation facilities. Mussolini, since we have arrived at him, has muscled into all the guidebooks in Rome, even those purporting to be devoted to the life and achievement of Appius Claudius and Augustus Caesar. Over the shoulder of every great consul and emperor, every painter and sculptor, peers the busy head of Benito the Magnificent, stealing the light of ancient glories. 
Let us begin, says one of the guidebooks, from the capital, the center and heart of the town's life, the majesty of which Michelangelo has expressed in terms of architecture, and which, from the genius and love of Mussolini, has received a new and still more solemn dignity. Whereupon the guide to Rome's treasures and antiquities degenerates into a preface to Mussolini. At the end of every guidebook in English, one expects to see the famous lines of Browning, slightly changed by official order, Open my heart, and you will see graven inside of it, Il Duce. The great man has, of course, gone too far with his face. His elated subjects are incapable of snickering, but men cannot continue forever to cheer the utterly commonplace. The striking of a clock in a town of clocks, the falling of rain in a rainy land, a glowering familiar face on every wall and hoarding. In a movie theater in Rome, during a newsreel, the belligerent figure of the helmeted dux, striding across the screen, ripe for applause, was received in complete silence. There was, to be sure, no disapproval in the silence, no hint of strain about it. It was simply devoid of any quality at all, like the eyes of a man looking out a train window. It may be because of the psychological necessity to laugh at some face or other that the heads of Laurel and Hardy are to be seen everywhere in Italy, running Il Duce a fairly close second. You find them on signboards, in movie lobbies, on the walls of buildings, as decorations on fancy stationery, in the form of figurines, ashtrays, toys, and porta fortunas. It is, of course, too much to hope that the Italianos detect in Signor Hardy a certain resemblance to the leader. The Saturday Evening Post, to go on to something more interesting, costs 50 cents, 10 lira in Italy, and Photoplay, 75 cents. I have actually seen Americans carrying copies of them about, too. This is no doubt why the vendors of tortoiseshell and camellias in the streets of Naples invariably approach an American with the chant, You millionaire, I broke! You millionaire, I broke! It just happens, I told one of them, that I saved less than $400,000 out of the Wall Street crash. He still insisted I was a millionaire. Nobody believes or pays much attention to anything an American or Englishman says in Italy. They are held in a kind of negligent contempt as the last millionaire representatives of a decadent and outmoded form of government destined to end up as a footnote to the history books of the totalitarian future. English and American books, newspapers, and magazines attacking fascism you can buy anywhere. The issue of Time, carrying a colored reproduction of Peter Bloom's painting, which presents the head of Mussolini as a jack-in-the-box, was on sale at every kiosk in Rome for a week. Icus attacks fascism, shouted the front page of the Paris Herald Tribune from a rack in front of a store in the Piazza di Spagna. If it's written English, it's written water, appears to be the official government attitude, if it has any attitude, toward the printed chatterings of the dying democracies. On the bulletin board in the first-class lounge of the ship from Naples to Genoa appeared three separate copies of the day's wireless news in English. I took one of them as a souvenir. The leading story, under a Washington dateline, began, I quote exactly, as follows. In long-awaited address to Congress, Roosevelt plunged straight into international situation, state's Daily Telegraph correspondent, and speech which broadcasted throughout world declared that dictatorships jeopardized civilization and world peace only safe in democracy's hands. A summary of the whole speech followed. I asked a steward who spoke English what he thought about it. He just laughed. So did I, perhaps a bit hollowly. The sharpest impression that I brought out of Italy was a vivid mental image of the late Colonel Johnstone of the 5th New York Cavalry, of all people. A certain tableau in which the Colonel became involved some 75 years ago was brought to my attention, amazingly enough, in the lounge of the Grand Hotel in Sorrento, and for a time erased from my memory the fond picture of Cato the Elder embracing his wife during a thunderstorm. In this hotel lounge, there was a bookcase holding perhaps the strangest assortment of English books to be found on the continent, among them Harold McGrath's Man on the Box, Lily Wesselhoft's, I think it was Wesselhoft's, Flip Wing the Spy, the New York Stock Exchange Investment Guide for 1912, and seven or eight enormous volumes containing the official reports of officers of the Federal Army and of the Army of the Confederate States of America on the various battles and campaigns of the War of the Rebellion. I took the volume entitled Chancellorsville to read after dinner one night. 
It contains, in addition to the complete records of that great battle, sundry accounts of less important engagements during the spring of 1863. Every now and then, the exploits of Captain, later Major, John S. Mosby, the celebrated rebel guerrilla leader, pop up. One report of his activities is set down by a northern lieutenant I must give in full, for it bodies forth, in a brief and vivid frame of words, the deathless vignette of Colonel Johnstone of the 5th New York Cavalry that so deeply affected me. Fairfax Courthouse, Virginia, March 9, 1863, 3.30 a.m. General Commanding. Captain Mosby, with his command, entered this town this morning at 2 a.m. They captured my patrols, horses, etc. They took Brigadier General Stoughton and horses and all his men detached from his brigade. They took every horse they could find, public and private, and the commanding officer of the post, Colonel Johnstone of the 5th New York Cavalry, made his escape from them in a nude state by accident. They searched for me in every direction, but being on the Vienna Road, visiting outposts, I made my escape. L. L. O'Connor, Lieutenant Provo Marshal. My recollection of what the soldiers of the Duce look like has been somewhat obscured by this clear-cut picture of the confused hell that broke loose in Fairfax Courthouse on the morning of March 9, 1863. The eight million heirs of Caesar's 10th Legion, who, with the armies of the Führer and the Mikado, may some day unite against communism, democracy, and the other powers of darkness in order to bring light and peace to an undisciplined world, may be something to worry about. If so, you will have to worry about them. Italy and her boasts and threats have begun to fade from my mind. I keep thinking of Colonel Johnstone of the 5th New York Cavalry. I can't help wondering whatever became of him. There's no place like home. Idling through a London bookstore in the summer of 1937, I came upon a little book called Collins Pocket Interpreters, France, written especially to instruct the English how to speak French in the train, the hotel, the quandary, the dilemma, etc. It is, of course, equally useful, I might also say equally depressing, to Americans. I have come across a number of these helps for travelers, but none that has the heavy impact, the dark cumulative power of Collins's. A writer in a London magazine mentions a phrase book got out in the era of Imperial Russia which contained this one magnificent line, Oh dear, our postillion has been struck by lightning. But that fantastic piece of disaster, while charming and provocative, though I dare say quite rare even in the days of the Tsar, is to Mr. Collins' modern workaday disasters as Fragonard is to George Bellows or Sarah Orne Jewett to William Faulkner. Let us turn the pages of this appalling little volume. Each page has a list of English expressions, one under the other, which gives them the form of verse. The French translations are run alongside. Thus, on the first page, under the port of arrival, we begin, quietly enough, with, Porter, here is my baggage. Porter, voici mes bagages. From then on, disaster follows fast and follows faster, until in the end, as you shall see, all hell breaks loose. The volume contains three times as many expressions to use when one is in trouble as when everything is going all right. This, my own experience has shown, is about the right ratio, but God spare me from some of the difficulties for which the traveler is prepared in Mr. Collins' melancholy narrative poem. I am going to leave out the French translations because, for one thing, people who get involved in the messes and tangles we are coming to invariably forget their French and scream in English anyway. Furthermore, the French would interrupt the fine, free flow of the English and spoil what amounts to a dramatic tragedy of an overwhelming and original kind. The phrases, as I have said, run one under the other, but herein I shall have to run them one after the other. You can copy them down the other way if you want to. Trouble really starts in the canto called In the Customs Shed. Here we have, I cannot open my case. I have lost my keys. Help me to close this case. I did not know that I had to pay. I don't want to pay so much. I cannot find my porter. Have you seen Porter 153? That last query is a little masterstroke of writing, I think, for in those few words we have a graphic picture of a tourist lost in a jumble of thousands of bags and scores of customs men, 
looking frantically for one of at least 153 porters. We feel that the tourist will not find Porter 153, and the note of frustration has been struck. One tourist, accompanied by his wife, I like to think, finally gets on the train for Paris, having lost his keys and not having found his porter, and it comes time presently to go to the dining car, although he probably has no appetite, for the customs men, of course, have had to break open that one suitcase. Now I think it is the wife who begins to crumble. Someone has taken my seat. Excuse me, sir, that seat is mine. I cannot find my ticket. I have left my ticket in the compartment. I will go and look for it. I have left my gloves, my purse, in the dining car. Here the note of frenzied disintegration so familiar to all travelers abroad is sounded. Next comes the sleeper, which begins ominously with what is the matter, and ends with may I open the window. Can you open this window, please? We realize, of course, that nobody is going to be able to open the window and that the tourist and his wife will suffocate. In this condition, they arrive in Paris, and the scene there on the crowded station platform is done with superb economy of line. I have left something in the train, a parcel, an overcoat, a Macintosh, a stick, an umbrella, a camera, a fur, a suitcase. The travelers have now begun to go completely to pieces in the grand manner. Next comes an effective little interlude about an airplane trip, which is one of my favorite passages in this swift and sorrowful tragedy. I want to reserve a place in the plane leaving tomorrow morning. When do we start? Can we get anything to eat on board? When do we arrive? I feel sick. Have you any paper bags for air sickness? The noise is terrible. Have you any cotton wool? When are we going to land? This brief masterpiece caused me to cancel an air trip from London to Paris and go the easy way across the channel. We now come to a section called At the Hotel, in which things go from worse to awful. Did you not get my letter? I wrote to you three weeks ago. I asked for a first-floor room. If you can't give me something better, I shall go away. The chambermaid never comes when I ring. I cannot sleep at night. There is so much noise. I have just had a wire. I must leave at once. Panic has begun to set in, and it is not appeased any by the advent of the chambermaid. Are you the chambermaid? There are no towels here. The sheets on this bed are damp. This room is not clean. I have seen a mouse in the room. You will have to set a mouse trap here. The bells of hell at this point begin to ring in earnest. These shoes are not mine. I put my shoes here. Where are they now? The light is not good. The bulb is broken. The radiator is too warm. The radiator doesn't work. It is cold in this room. This is not clean. Bring me another. I don't like this. I can't eat this. Take it away. I somehow now see the tourist's wife stalking angrily out of the hotel to get away from it all without any shoes on, and properly enough the booklet seems to follow her course, first under guides and interpreters. You are asking too much. I will not give you any more. I shall call a policeman. He can settle this affair. Then under inquiring the way, I am lost. I was looking for... Someone robbed me. That man robbed me. That man is following me everywhere. She rushes to the hairdresser, where, for a change, everything goes quite smoothly until the water is too hot, you are scalding me. Then she goes shopping, but there is no surcease. You have not given me the right change. I bought this two days ago. It doesn't work. It is broken. It is torn. It doesn't fit me. Then to a restaurant for a snack and a reviving cup of tea. This is not fresh. This piece is too fat. This doesn't smell very nice. There is a mistake in the bill. While I was dining, someone has taken my purse. I have left my glasses, my watch, a ring, in the lavatory. Madness has now come upon her, and she rushes wildly out into the street. Her husband, I think, has at the same time plunged blindly out of the hotel to find her. We come then, quite naturally, to accident, which is calculated to keep the faint of heart, nay, the heart of oak, safely at home by his own fireside. There has been an accident. Go and fetch a policeman quickly. Is there a doctor near here? Send for the ambulance. He is seriously injured. She has been run over. 
He has been knocked down. Someone has fallen into the water. The ankle, the arm, the back, a bone, the face, the finger, the foot, the head, the knee, the leg, the neck, the nose, the wrist, the shoulder. He has broken his arm. He has broken his leg. He has a sprained ankle. He has a sprained wrist. He is losing blood. He has fainted. He has lost consciousness. He has burnt his face. It is swollen. It is bleeding. Bring some cold water. Help me to carry him. Apparently, you just let her lie there while you attend to him. But, of course, she was merely run over, whereas he has taken a terrific tossing around. We next see the husband and wife back in their room at the dreary hotel, both in bed and both obviously hysterical. This scene is entitled Illness. I am feeling very ill. Send for the doctor. I have pains in... I have pains all over. The back, the chest, the ear, the head, the eyes, the heart, the joints, the kidneys, the lungs, the stomach, the throat, the tongue. Put out your tongue. The heart is affected. I feel a pain here. He is not sleeping well. He cannot eat. My stomach is out of order. She is feverish. I have caught a cold. I have caught a chill. He has a temperature. I have a cough. Will you give me a prescription? What must I do? Must I stay in bed? I feel better. When will you come and see me again? Biliousness, rheumatism, insomnia, sunstroke, fainting, a fit, hoarseness, sore throat, the medicine, the remedy, a poultice, a draft, a tablespoonful, a teaspoonful, a sticking plaster, senna, iodine. That last suicidal bleat for iodine is to me a masterful touch. Our couple finally get on their feet again, for travelers are tough, they've got to be, but we see under the next heading common words and phrases that they are left forever punch-drunk and shattered. Can I help you? Excuse me. Carry on. Look here. Look down there. Look up there. Why? How? When? Where? Because. That's it. It is too much. It is too dear. It is very cheap. Who? What? Which? Look out. Those are Valkyries, one feels, riding around and above and under our unhappy husband and wife. The book sweeps on to a mad operatic ending of the tragedy, with all the strings and brasses and woodwinds going full blast. Where are we going? Where are you going? Come quickly and see. I shall call a policeman. Bring a policeman. I shall stay here. Will you help me? Help fire. Who are you? I don't know you. I don't want to speak to you. Leave me alone. That will do. You are mistaken. It was not I. I didn't do it. I will give you nothing. Go away now. It has nothing to do with me. Where should one apply? What must I do? What have I done? I have done nothing. I have already paid you. I have paid you enough. Let me pass. Where is the British consulate? The oboes take that last despairing wail and the curtain comes down. Appendix This underdeveloped snapshot of Cato, which catches him in a not unbecoming light, I found in the pages of Momsen's History of Rome when I was in Italy five years ago. At that time and in that place, almost any ancient Roman was bound to seem to me an admirable and amusing fellow by comparison with the fascist dictator, old stab in the back. There is a well-rounded portrait of Cato in Plutarch's Lives, and a full-length painting done in burning oils in H.G. Wells' Outline of History. For the sins of Marcus Porcius Cato were dark and manifold. He abandoned in Spain the war horse which had carried him to triumph there. He sold his slaves when they became old. He practiced usury on a grand scale. During his ten years of office as censor, Cato interfered with the pastimes, pleasures, and privileges of practically everyone in Rome except himself. He shook his little fist at the philosophy and culture of Greece and persecuted her teachers. It was mainly because of him that the land on which Carthage once had stood was plowed up and sown with salt. I have reprinted after Cato what, in this book, 
partly because the piece also contains a glimpse of Colonel Johnstone of the 5th New York Cavalry flitting through the soft darkness of a Virginia night in the year of our Lord, 1863. I didn't want to leave that out of this collection, for it is one of my favorite moments in history. Shortly after the story appeared in The New Yorker, seven or eight Southerners wrote me, one of them from Fairfax Courthouse, to report what had actually happened to Colonel Johnstone on that night. It seems that he concealed himself with great ingenuity and the highest kind of courage under the seat of an outside toilet, where he remained until Mosby and his men had gone. Thereupon he emerged, surely one of the most remarkable figures of the war between the states. This concludes the reading of My World and Welcome to It. Your reader has been